السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجال كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ربي شاه لي صدي ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah, I'm grateful to be here once again with you to reflect on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The beautiful attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will discuss today is al-nur. And al-nur means light. It signifies the source of all light and guidance in the universe is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's even a chapter in the Quran called al-nur. The human intellect is not powerful enough to make judgments in the sphere of the divine or to unravel all the mysteries of the universe. that are only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or to even reach an understanding about Allah with study and deliberation, with all of that work, still we won't be able to get to that depth. And it is for this reason that the most elaborate of explanations that we can learn about or give or read about will fell short of describing every quality, every attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the depth that it deserves. And why is that? Because whatever we can understand from nature, from science, is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place. However, even as we acknowledge our inability and our powerlessness to gain a perfect and deep understanding of the limitless nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can still achieve a great degree of proximity and a relative understanding of Allah by using metaphors. So when we try and explain a phenomenon, that is not familiar to us. Maybe it's a word, maybe it's a concept. The best way for us to understand is through metaphors. And this style of giving familiarity to ourselves with truths gives us two basic things that we can learn from. One is that by using metaphors, we incline the heart towards this phenomenon with beauty and subtlety in the language that we use. And the second thing we get from this is that it reveals secrets about the phenomenon that may otherwise not be revealed to us. So we start to begin learning about that phenomenon. And this is precisely what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does in Surah Nur, verse 35, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the power of Nur with a metaphor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, quote, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. His light is like a niche in which there is a lamp. The lamp is in a crystal. The crystal is like a shining star lit from the oil of a blessed olive tree, located neither to the east nor the west. whose oil would almost glow even without being touched by fire. Light upon light, Allah guides whoever he wills to his light, and Allah sets forth parables for humanity, for Allah has perfect knowledge of all things. So this specific verse in uh, Surah An-Nur, verse number 35, chapter 24, this is also referred to as Ayat An-Nur by some. And there's a few things happening in this verse that Allah, um, in this verse that Allah has explained to us. So Allah has, using the parable of a lamp to explain a phenomenon to us. And as I just mentioned, we need these metaphors to understand a concept or a phenomenon better. And in this case, the phenomenon that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing to us is Allahu nuru samawati wal ard, or Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And as you know, we know Allah is an nur, Allah is also telling us that he has perfect knowledge of all things. And this should highlight for us Um, that because Allah has perfect knowledge of all things, and we as Muslims believe this particular fact, then we should understand that we do not have perfect knowledge of all things. So when Allah uses parables to explain something to us, it's an acknowledgement that we don't have perfect knowledge because we require the use of relatable metaphors to make concepts clear so that we can understand and receive this knowledge. Another way to think about it is if you're trying to communicate to someone in a language that you don't speak and they don't speak, we will use some kind of gestures, some kind of examples and finger pointing to say, this is what we're asking about or telling about. 
So going back to Anur, in this verse, Allah is emphasizing that his sacred light embraces all of existence. It illuminates not just the heavens, but also the earth. And Allah is the all-knowing creator. So the first question that arises from this verse is about the metaphor that Allah uses. Why does Allah you choose um, you know, a lamp? And a lamp is a man-made object. And it's not even a source of great light. So as a metaphor, how can we use this? How, how is it that, why is it that Allah doesn't use, for example, the sun? And the sun has much greater ability to generate light. It's a much more powerful object in this universe because it's able to generate light that can span many, many planets. So why does Allah choose an object, a lowly object like the lamp? So we could reply to this question by saying that the sun or the sunlight does not discriminate. The sun shines light on any object, the mountains, the fields, the animals, all of nature depends on the light from the sun. So as, as people, even if you're a believer or non-believer, we all benefit from the light of the sun. Everyone, uh, believers or non-believers, we can rationalize the existence of the sun and the benefits of the sun. So if every human being, believer or non-believer, can benefit from the sun, then it seems like that is the most, that is the best choice to use as a metaphor. However, if we go back to the verse and we read the beginning of the verse, Allah tells us, his light is like a niche in which there is a lamp. So let's think about this niche for a moment. Let's say we are in our home. There's darkness all around us, but our surrounding is familiar to us because it's our home. And let's say there's something in another room that we want to get. And because we're in our home, and despite being surrounded by darkness, we don't have any fear. So we choose to travel in the darkness to the other room of our house. And even if we knew the layout, like the back of our hand, of our home, because of this darkness, we'll still run into obstacles. We'll still bump into walls. We'll still run over things that might be on the floor, maybe trip and fall. And we would fumble our way, feeling our way, touching the furniture, reaching all around us until we get to the room that we want to go to. And after some toil, we would eventually reach where we want to be. But even then, we haven't you know, retrieved the thing we wanted to retrieve in the first place. So we would then continue to fumble around. We would then continue to keep touching things until we find the thing we need. So... If we had a source of light in our hand, let's say a lamp, then that light from the lamp would have made it easy for us to go from one room to the next. And then once we reach that other room, find the thing we're actually looking for. The challenge would be much easier. In fact, it probably wouldn't even be a challenge for us if we had a lamp in our hand. So let's, let's pick on that a little bit more, okay? Before we can actually use the lamp, we have, to, we have to actually acquire it. You know, we have to be able to have access to a lamp. And even if we did have the lamp, we need fuel for the lamp so that the lamp can continue power the light that it's generating. And before we can even use the lamp, we have to learn how to operate that lamp. So someone would have either taught us how to operate this lamp, or we would have acquired this knowledge, uh, either Allah giving us because we have curiosity or through some other means. But once we know how to operate that lamp, we can then light the lamp. And in order to light the lamp, we have to provide a spark. And the spark is the thing that starts the lamp, and the oil in the lamp sustains the flame that lights the room. This is truly wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, using the metaphor of the lamp. So let's, let's try and understand how. So unlike the sun, the lamp demands that we have intention and we have belief. So we can replace the spark with the desire to achieve success in the task that we set ourselves to achieve. And this is the intention to find guidance. We can replace the acquisition of a lamp with the work we must do to find that which will give us light and illuminate the way. So that's the lamp. And this is also the belief that at the end of this effort, we will possess the ability to find the thing we're looking for. And then we can replace the oil in that, in that example with the power that will sustain us so that we can complete the task. So this is also the belief that, you know, we seek guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the journeys that we take. 
So if we go back to the verse one more time, towards the end of that verse, Allah says, Allah guides whoever he wills to his light. And this, this is the line that completes the metaphor of the lamp. So how do we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide us? This also is mentioned in the Quran. So if we go back to Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 186, Allah tells us, quote, When my servants ask you, O Prophet, about me, I am truly near. I respond to one's prayer when they call upon me. So let them respond with obedience to me and believe in me. Perhaps they will be guided to the right way. So what Allah is telling us here is that if we want to seek guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all we have to do is ask. To ask, we have to have the intention for it. So have the intention, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We must also have the belief that Allah will give us guidance or whatever we're asking for so that our journey in this world will be illuminated for the duration of our time in this world. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us also to ask for guidance from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and this is recorded in an authentic hadith. Um, Abdullah ibn Abbas reported that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would say the following dua at the end of his night prayer after glorifying Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So he would say his prayer, he would glorify Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and toward the ends of his night prayer, he would recite this following dua: Allahumma ali nuran fi kalbi. And the translation of this is, O oh Allah, give me a light in my heart and give me a light in my hearing and give me a light in my sight. Give me a light on my right, give me a light on my left, give me a light in front of me and give me a light behind me and increase me in light. Increase me in light and increase me in light. This is a beautiful dua from the Prophet ﷺ that emphasizes the use of the word nur to represent guidance and protection. Not just guidance in action, but protection and guidance in all aspects of our personal lives. And our Prophet ﷺ is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for light in his heart first. So this dua itself is filled with wisdom. So the first thing the Prophet ﷺ is asking about light in his heart. And this is not a physical heart. This is the spiritual heart, the qalb. Why the heart first? Because without the connection to and knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that exists in our heart, nothing else will matter. We'll just be fumbling around with our physical senses from our personal experiences with the world or the environment that's around us. So we know from our experience that there are five senses. There's five physical senses. There's the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the skin. So from the physical senses, in this dua, the Prophet ﷺ is making references to only two of them. And they are the hearing, so the ears, and sight, eyes. So why is it that, Allah, that the Prophet ﷺ is only referencing two of these things? So by asking, um, asking about these things, these are the ways in which um, ideas come into our mind. These are the ways in which we learn. So by asking Allah to give guidance and protection to the eyes and the ears, the Prophet Sallallahu is asking Allah to um, you know, make sure that the, the thoughts that come to his mind which lead to actions are actually that which will be pleasing to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And we don't have to look very far uh, in our personal life to, to see examples of this. You know, one easy quick example is through social media. You know, think about the last time you listened to something that caused you to act on or stop when you're doing uh, when you're listening or watching something, okay? Or you gave space to someone else's idea because you saw or heard that on social media. Or, or even a TV show or a movie or something else where you consume content from. So when we receive an idea or an image while listening, you know, we are influenced by it. So the Prophet Sallallahu is asking Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the kind of, protect him from, uh, from the kind of influences that would negatively affect him and his actions. Okay, because that, you know, the this thought that comes into our mind is going to result in an action that could harm us, not just in this world, but in the hereafter. So the Prophet Sallallahu is asking uh, for protection. And then he goes on in his dua to ask Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him light on his right, his left, his front, and his back. Think about the wisdom in this part of the dua. He Sallallahu is asking Allah to surround him with those who will benefit him. Okay, not just anyone. Don't just surround him with anyone, but give him access to those who will um, be a benefit to him, meaning those who are 
rightly guided. So the example of the light again. And then he asks Allah to increase him in light as well. Why? So that he can also be the source of guidance to others, those around him. So he is asking to surround him with those who are guided and also make him a source of guidance for those that he surrounds. What a powerful dua. What a beautiful dua. And then he asks in the end to increase him in light, not just once, but three more times. So total four times in this dua. And in Islam, the light is a powerful metaphor that represents knowledge, guidance, protection, and divine presence. Physical light, we know, allows us to see the world around us, while the spiritual light enables us to understand the deeper truths of existence. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah tells us, Allah is the guardian of the believers. He brings them out of darkness and into light. As for the disbelievers, their guardians are false gods who lead them out of light and into darkness. So our Prophet ﷺ is a beacon of light for us because it was to him that the Qur'an was revealed. In Surah Ibrahim, we are told, quote, This is a book which we have revealed to you, O Prophet, so that you may lead people out of darkness and into light by the will of their Lord, to the path of the Almighty, the praiseworthy. So our beloved Prophet ﷺ is a guide for us on earth who is appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by that extension, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Quran the light for us on this earth, even after the passing of the Prophet So Allah is the source of light for all the believers. Allah sustains everything that he has created, not just in this universe, but also in the heavens. And the prophets carry this message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forward. So they are the beacons of light, the spiritual beacons of light for us on this earth. And after their passing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance remains with us until the day of judgment in the form of the Quran. And this is one of the miracles of the Quran that it will continue to remain until the day of judgment. And in Surah Dhariyat, we are told, I did not create jinn and humans except to worship me. So by extension, to worship someone is to know someone. And it is in our nature to love. We love people and we love things. We love places and we love experiences. And in the physical sense, when we love someone or something, we want to learn about that someone or that something. Think about how many people adore and admire celebrities and follow them because they, they are taken back by them. They love them. They want to learn more about them. They want to learn more about them in the deepest of possible senses. And in the spiritual sense, this is also true. When we pay attention to our spiritual needs, like we pay attention to our physical needs, we should realize that we need to learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot love An-Nur or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is in our nature. So when we love, we want to learn. We want to spend time with the thing that we love. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful because we are only knowledgeable to the extent that we are guided. And we should continue to seek that guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran so that we may live our lives under the guidance of Allah. And may Allah increase us in knowledge and give us wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I, I hope you find some benefit from this reflection today. Like everyone, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive my shortcomings and for any mistakes I have made today in my statements. From a practical sense, how can we apply a nur to our lives? That is one of the, the ways in which we can connect ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to make sure that we understand and then apply. So I can suggest three ways in which we can do this. One, is trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. When Allah tells us that something is haram, avoid it. There are things in this world that are prohibited for us, even when others might act upon them or support them or find them acceptable. And if we want to call ourselves Muslims, and Muslim means one who submits to the will of Allah, 
we need to act on the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes that's easy, sometimes that's not. But we have to strive, we have to try. And then when we fail, we have to reflect on it and ask Allah, you know, please forgive me for what I've done. And to seek knowledge and guidance about our deen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the scholars of Islam. Does it mean when we listen to a scholar of Islam or somebody who knows a greater deal about Islam than we do, that we just park our intellect in the corner and then we just take what they say at face value? Absolutely not. We don't do that because Allah encourages us to reflect on the Quran and the knowledge that we receive through others who do the same. And this too is stated in the Quran. You know, when we reflect on the knowledge we receive, we will act on it because we have accepted it and internalized it. And it's incumbent upon all of us to study the Quran so that we can recognize when someone is saying something that does not align with the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And conversely, when somebody does something that you know doesn't align with the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And lastly, we should reflect on our own actions. And it is through this reflection that we can improve ourselves and we can grow from the experiences we have. The word that we commonly use is continuous improvement. If we don't reflect on our actions, then we won't react to becoming a better Muslim. And then what is the benefit from that experience that we can gain? So that is that is the last thought that I will leave with you in the way of practical suggestions. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us guidance and keep us on the path that will lead us all to genital for those. Allahumma ameen. I ask Allah to bless us with pious spouses and offspring who will be the joy of our hearts and make us models for the righteous. I ask Allah to forgive our sins, absolve us of our misdeeds, and allow us each to die as one of the virtuous. I ask Allah to make us and those from our descendants to keep up with prayers. I ask Allah to forgive us, our parents and the believers in the day when the judgment will come to pass. Ya Allah, do not let our hearts deviate after you have guided us. Grant us your mercy. We are indeed the giver. You are indeed the giver of all bounties. Ya Allah, do not subject us to the persecution of the disbelievers. Forgive us. You alone are truly the Almighty, all wise. Ya Allah, we have believed, so forgive us and have mercy on us, for you are the best of those who show mercy. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurata ayyune wa jialna al-muttakina imama. Rabbana faqfir lana zunubana wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawafana ma labrar. Rabbi jialni mukimu salati wa min zuriyati. Rabbana wa taqabal dua. Rabbana khfirli wa li walidaya wa lil mu'minina yawman yakumu hisab. Rabbana la tuzir kulubana ba'da iz hadaytana wa hablana bilna dunka rahma inna ka anta al-wahab. Rabbana la tajalna fitnata lil zina kafuru wa khfir lana rabbana inna ka anta al-azizul hakim. Rabbana amanna faqfir lana wa rahamna inna ka anta wa khayru rahimin. إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام للمرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين